In the midst of the Stalingrad battle, the factory collectives of the region, the supporting edge of the power, worked for the front, it seemed, on the limit of possibilities, but Sverdlovsky, Perm and Chelyabinsk residents, on the initiative of the communists, decided to make one more additional contribution to the cause of victory. On the collected voluntary funds, over and above the plans and assignments of the State Defence Committee, in the off-hours voluntary overtime labour was gratuitously produced weapons and equipment for a large tank unit, according to the latest state of the art at that time. To serve in it, it was decided to let those who wished to serve from those who were not drafted into the army assigned to the production. The selection was strict. 156,000 applications from those who aspired to go to the front were received. 11,000 of them were enlisted. From Sverdlovskerm, Chelyabinsk tank brigades with battalions of machine gunners, from reinforcement units artillery, motorcycle, mortar, sapper and others, created in the same way in different cities of the region, and formed the Ural Volunteer. In the spring of 1943 volunteers began to engage in combat training for 16 hours a day, and in the summer the corps joined the 4th Tank Army. Those leaving for the front were escorted to the front by the workers of the region. In the solemn, shivering to the goosebumps on the back of the atmosphere we swore to our fellow countrymen to return only with victory, to fight with the Nazi invaders, not sparing neither blood nor life itself. The Euralians jealously followed every combat step of our corps, visited us at the front sent delegations, each of us corresponded with our collective, from which we left to fight, reported about every battle. We were given crumbs of gifts for holidays, taking from the meagre rations of wartime. I remember, in April of the 44th, at the end of combat operations in the right bank Ukraine, we were overtaken by a wagon of dumplings sent by fellow countrymen for the day of the Red Army. The dumplings, having travelled for two months, while the addressee came out of the battle, of course lost, to put it mildly, their marketable appearance. The volunteers were not hungry by that time the food in the army had already become perfectly nourishing, but everyone ate a full pot of the former dumplings. We received replenishment mainly from the Urals. In the late autumn of the 43rd, our Ural, in the battles already awarded the rank of guards, the corps stood, camouflaged in the dense Bryansk forests, to reform. We were taken from the front line a little to the rear to replenish people, equipment, to put in order. We settled down aside from the highway, approximately in the middle between the cities in ruins Bryansk and Karakov. Our battalion of tank troopers was knocked out by three quarters, if not more. The commander Vasily Yakovlevich Fursov was severely wounded, he did not return to service. Front newspapers wrote Fursov's legendary battalion when they told about hand-to-hand -hand fights of our machine gunners with the enemy. Our company commander Sasha Nikolaev, a dapper, dashing, desperately brave officer, next to whom everyone in battle became self-consciously daring, we also lost, even considered dead. But he survived and became a hero of the Soviet Union. After the pitiless battles in the Oral region, the corps became authoritative with the command of our army as a reliable compound. And the enemy felt that the volunteer tank should be reckoned with. Even in official reports, Hitlerites called our core Ural Communist Division, Wild Division of Fanatics and Division of Black Knives Schwarzmesser and Division. On this occasion, we sang the song of the Black Knives, which was also performed at amateur concerts. Everyone liked it very much. It was composed by volunteer soldiers, students of the Ural Conservatory Ivanovchenin, he died near Berlin, and Non-Com. The knives in black frame were made as a gift to the volunteers by workers of Zlatust, and they came in handy more than once for our machine gunners and tankers in hand-to-hand -hand battles, giving rise to panic rumours among German soldiers. At us this knife on a belt first of all symbolised belonging to the Urals. It was used in extreme cases and worked mainly for authority. A black knife on the belt is beautiful, manly and rare. The song is simple, unassuming. But the motive is peculiar, cheerful and a little thoughtful. We'll write to the Grey Ural. Be confident in your sons. We were given daggers for a reason. So that the fascists would be afraid of them. We'll write we're fighting as we should. And the work gift is good. Oh, the fascist bastards don't like.
our black steel knife from the Urals. Before the front, I was a sheet roller. Rough work, with pliers in my hands, a profession not very connected with the subtleties of technology. That's why I was not sent to the tank battalion, to the crew at the reforming in the Bryansk forest. And taking into account that before the battles in our tank company of automatic riflemen I was chosen as a consorg, the command decided to make a political officer out of me. And the front fate firmly connected me with our Beatty. We called Alexander Andreevich Tatakauchenko, the deputy battalion commander on political part, usually very respectfully sometimes among the commanders, a little familiarly. He was known as a slow-talking, dry and stern officer. He had served in the Red Army for the most part of his life and had learned everything by practical experience. Much older than any of our soldiers, sergeants or officers, Alexander Andreevich treated everyone in a fatherly way, which he always did with touching sincerity and, I would say, wisdom. That's why he was called father. Because of the war, many of us have not seen our fathers for a long time. Some of us have lost them. And guys feel their absence keenly. That's why it turned out that we all loved our battalion father, loved and feared him. Sometimes we insulted him, but we obeyed him unconditionally, as it is supposed to be in a military collective. So Batya then he was still a captain called me and said, On my recommendation, the political department of the brigade appointed you, comrade junior sergeant, commissar of the battalion. Proceed. But, comrade captain, I tried to argue. Stop talking, he interrupted me. Do you think it will be easier for you to be a comsporter? And suddenly, he added, with a heart your crazy volunteers, that's what I'll tell you. You wanted to join the army to the front, but you take any promotion as an insult. Darkness. And now the new recruits have arrived. When nowadays they broadcast on the radio, boys, boys, you were the first to rush into battle. Boys, 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 you covered the country with yourselves. I go away, this song turns my soul upside down. From the first days of the war, mostly young men fought at the front. 17th, 18th year of birth. 20th, 21st, 21st, 22nd, our rapidly thinning generation. In 1943, it was the turn of the 25th year to be drafted. The boys were barely 18, and many managed to get into the army and before their time, Adding a year to themselves, it was done, simply the six in the documents clipped and corrected the resulting five, the 25th year of birth, instead of the 26th. Sad was the scene of the appearance of the boys that had been sent to us in the Bryansk forest. A dense rain was drizzling down, and the thick aspen trees shivering between the mighty pines were dropping their last purple leaves. The smokes of our battalion's stoves were drifting. They're here. They're here, rang out in the neighbourhood. We came out of the dugouts that we had managed to dig with the expectation of replenishment, to close them with a good quality roof, to heat them, to warm them up. There were very few of us. In front of us, on an alley cut out in the thicket, stood an uneven line of skinny soldiers. Not tall, they were slouching in overcoats that were too thick for their height. They took off their hats, wiped their wet, as if crying faces with the lining for a long time. They shook themselves off, as if the drops of rain were an unbearable additional weight for them, and the frost settled on their machine-cut heads with white dust. We understood everything, that the war was in its third year, and that we had no food in the factory orals, which, like the rest of the country, gave the best to the front, and that they were tired from the road. And the fact that they're still undertrained, we'll have to train them. We are old-timers, already guardsmen, among us there are already order-bearers. Some of us had time to pass, not only the battles, but also the hospital. And yet we were embarrassed. We looked, in comparison with the newcomers, simply rich men. And older. The fighters who had seen something, though still boys themselves, were bushy-haired, curly-haired, busty and well-fed. And these are bare-breasted, thick-skinned boys. Ivan Kutsurak, the acting commander, accepted the report, greeted them and congratulated them on their arrival. He was so upset that he immediately went to his dugout to calm down, to gather his thoughts. What to do, where to start. After all, soon in the battles. Batya stayed in front of the formation. It is not proper for a political officer to lose heart. He must have the stamina for the whole battalion. 
And maybe that's why Alexander Andreevich turned grey so early and shaved his head naked. That's how it is younger. Otherwise it's awkward in the youth battalion he jokingly justified himself. Well, how? Swifts. He began with a meaningless question, mockingly and tenderly looking at the guys. Silence. And we are not Swifts, finally someone objected from the left flank, quietly and resentfully. Father smiled good-naturedly. Wow. There are roughs too? What's your name? Volunteer Private Badav, answered the boy loudly, and added Mikhail Georgievich, probably for the sake of respectability. Well done, said Batya. I'm serving the Soviet Union. Well done. If everyone is like that, then you'll be eagles. But for now, you'll be shearers, all of you. Like me. As if unintentionally, my father took off his cap and shook off the drops. The ranks smiled. No, the whole formation smiled, lit up somehow. And Batya continued, those of you who are volunteers, raise your hand. I mean, those who should not have been drafted yet, well, let's say, who somehow added a year to themselves or somehow cheated. Cunning and savvy are highly valued here. Nearly a third of the 400 raised their hand. Well, here we are. Father turned to us veterans and winked to see how many new volunteers have arrived. That's right. We've been informed that there's a great addition coming from the Urals. I hope all the others didn't mind going to the front too. Whose fathers are fighting? More than half the boys raised their hands. My father saw the gloomy faces of the rest of the boys who didn't raise their hands and added, and who had fathers who died. Almost all the others raised their hands. Snowflakes swirled in the dust of the rain. Father thoughtfully caught one in his palm, sighed, looked at the grey, almost black sky. Well, don't think that the weather here is always unhappy. It can be sunny. So let's consider our acquaintance begun. My surname is Tatakenko. I serve in the battalion as deputy commander in political affairs. Now you'll be taken to your dugouts. Dry yourselves, then we'll have lunch. He nodded to the veterans again and finished seriously. It's wonderful that we've got real fighting people, not sons of mama's skirt. That's exactly what we need. I congratulate you, our dear new comrades in arms, on your arrival to your fellow countrymen, to your blood Ural Volunteer Corps. This is a great good fortune for you. Petty officers, deploy your companies. As now I see our joker and dancer, never discouraged petty officer Vasya Koryakin, a railroad machinist from Kyrovograd. Despite the rain and snow without an overcoat, perfectly tucked in, polished and smelling of weight for me. Cologne for three metres, Vasya Koryakin approached the ranks in a parade-like manner, as if on an asphalt parade ground. As if the sun was shining and there was a holiday, and he was going to lead his swifts to dance or to the movies. Second company. Forward. Left shoulder forward step. March. And the swifts went, shoulders straightened, heads up. Boys. Boys. Vasily Koryakin. There was no more restless and enterprising petty officer. Only Nikolai Kulikov, a petty officer of the 1st Tank Battalion, a volunteer from Kamensky-Rolsky, could compete with him. Once on the 1st Ukrainian front, when moving from flank to flank, we got far to the rear and the petty officers were tormented by inspectors. One of them demanded that all soldiers should wear loincloths, the other resented why not all of them wore socks. And these petty officers ordered that all the guys on the right foot should wear loincloths and on the left foot a sock. At the inspection they only had to figure out what the inspector wanted. Even our Batya, to what a connoisseur of the most delicate details of army life, and that, hearing about this innovation, doubted. He met the company near the field kitchen and commanded take off the right boot, then the left. This is a mockery of the soldiers, comrade petty officer. No, it's not. Not at the soldiers. The volunteers were cunning. After our swifts arrived, the next day the smallest of them, Kostya Verkovic, was attacked by a dog. In broad daylight. He was standing at the post at the warehouse with canned food, wearing a helmet, looking like a mushroom, with an automatic rifle on his chest, and was carefully doing his duty. 
And why should a passing mongrel, which had been picked up and fed somewhere by the tankers of the 2nd Battalion, be interested in our costia? Stop. Stop. Get back. He chased it away. But the dog, whether it decided to play with him or got angry, grabbed him by the overcoat. Shaking his head, dragged him, tore him. Then again. And again. And the boy roared with surprise and annoyance. Probably such an attack on the sentry and his confusion looked funny two other swifts, stood aside and laughed, until the guide came running and helped Costia drove the dog away. It became known that our Ural Volunteer Corp would be awarded the guard's banner the other day. My father let the swifts talk. We found out that after the next battle everyone can be considered and presented to the rank of guards. But the nimble Mishabadayev, that at the first meeting took offence at the nickname Swifts, made a hopeless conclusion. We'll never see the badge of the guards, as if it were a badge of the guards. First we must learn to fight with puppies. In front of me lies an old photograph of Mishka he is in the hospital, in a dress shirt, with a badge guard screwed on it. This is his favourite picture for the rest of his life. There is another one he goes in a column of veterans of the Patriotic War on the festive Chelyabinsk, on the day of the 25th anniversary of the victory. Mikhail Georgievich became a father of four children, and now a grandfather. He is a trickster in conversations as before. Then, in the Bryansk forest, Arbatya took Kostya Verkoviak under his protection. I don't agree with Badeyev. Of course the case is unusual. But I'm sure if it hadn't been a dog. I'm telling them the same thing. Kostya Verkovic couldn't stand it. And the dog is ours, not German. And if it had been German? Misha asked Riley. I would have given a warning shot from a machine gun and then a line into it. Kostya answered without hesitation. Death to the German occupiers? Of course, they destroy everything in our country. And we to them. I couldn't find the words in the fervour. We'll reach Germany. Stop, 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 Batya calmed them down. Of course we'll come to Germany. But with what? Will we still have a head on our shoulders? And we'll probably think. There are different people in Germany, not just fascists. Which of you can explain the meaning of these facts? The first one. Everyone knows the recent trial in Krasnodar we sentenced a group of our traitors and SS Germans to death for atrocities. For the destruction of defenceless people, the trial was open. Everyone saw the details of the heinous deeds of Hitlerites and their accomplices, our traitors. It's like one attitude towards Germany, isn't it? And the second everyone knows as well that a meeting of representatives of German prisoners of war was held in Moscow and an anti-fascist committee Free Germany was formed. And we wholeheartedly support this committee. Do we contradict ourselves? So it's not fascists, it's democracy, said Misha Badeyev. Yes, they gathered on a democratic, worker-peasant basis. The intelligentsia has joined in clarified butcher. There's even some grandson of Bismarck on the committee, but he's also an anti-fascist. In the 45th, at the last stage of the breakthrough to Berlin, either in Lubbin or in Kotbis, near the gates of some factory, we came across two elderly Germans. In old leather caps, in short coarse half-coats, they stood silently looking at the column of our tanks that had burst into the city, and each held a raised fist at his shoulder. Our machine gunners, sitting on the armour, also greeted them, also raised a fist to the shoulder since the war in Spain. Since childhood, we knew the anti-fascists salute the company front. Two blocks later, the fighting began. Hitler's officers acted according to their own pattern to destroy us, let our tanks into the streets of the city, not at all taking into account that we had already learned well to conduct street tank battles. Our tankers, with a troop on the armour, tried to skip as close as possible to the centre of the cramped town. Then machine gunners jumped on the move, and the tankers, cooperating with them, patiently forged enemies defending in the streets, in administrative buildings. The manoeuvrability and power of our T-34s allowed to make intricate and most unexpected detours through yards and nooks, through houses, and the paratroopers helped their tank crews by infiltrating, penetrating everywhere and anywhere, weaponizing from anywhere, even from the roofs. And now the hard fighting is over. Two burned our tanks are burning, 
the rubber of the support rollers crackles and smokes in the small tongues of fire. The cars that remained in the line rumbling, lining up in a column to go on. On the mangled central square of the town, among the broken bushes of spring green acacia, the tankers less horsemen are digging a mass grave. They are working silently and fiercely a tanker, with no wheels is someone who lost his vehicle in battle, and therefore almost always his comrades. Automaticians help. On the asphalt, scratched in furrows from caterpillars, and in some places ploughed by shells, they spread a tarpaulin. On it there were dead people in an even row. Burnt, mutilated bodies in black helmets, overalls, and several shot swifts in protective coloured jackets. Our Bacha, the battalion deputy commander, comes up, pulls off his cap, looks at the dead. His head has a grey brush, he hasn't been shaved for a long time. And it ages him. Or maybe not only that. He stares at each person lying on the tarpaulin for a long time. He knows everyone well and doesn't say a word. And the tankers and machine gunners standing there in silence would not hear anything anyway, immersed in their bitter thoughts goodbye to friends forever, there is nothing worse in the world. Suddenly Batya became alarmed next to the dead guardsman lay a wrinkled man in an old leather cap and a civilian half-coat. His chest was pierced by a machine gun burst. This comrade guards major is the one who came out to meet us, explained the machine gunner who jumped up. Do you remember? Only we got caught on the outskirts. He's a German, someone said harshly. So what? Another objected. He's a worker. And the mechanic driver Palugriumov, a steel worker of our Verkizetsky plant, spoke with tears in his eyes. Why didn't you guys see it? He came out with his comrade. Both of them stood, raised their fists to their shoulder mouth front, so. Everybody saw it. And the Germans shot him, the Germans. I mean, not their own Germans, but the fascists. The second one was wounded too. Everyone looked at the deputy. Batya lowered his head and covered his eyes. An officer should not show his feelings in front of his subordinates, especially when the feelings are complicated. Our Batya buried many of his soldiers during the war. And now? Almost near Berlin? Put a citizen of an enemy state in the same mass grave with ours. Invite civilian Germans from the nearest cellars to the funeral, Batya finally said. Be polite. We'll do everything in the best way, Comrade Guards Major, assured him. In this city of the future German Democratic Republic, we were the first representatives of the army of our country. By the 45th year, our Swifts became real volunteers, said more than once after the war engineer, Vasily Nikolaevich Nikonov, former combatant of the second tank. Volunteer was quite a definite concept. At our Verkizetsky metallurgical plant, willing to go to the front turned out to be 150. Conditions, as I have already said, were set tough military technical and political literacy, perfect health, and most importantly teach, prepare a replacement at work, from women or young boys. This was the case at all plants. The last requirement was especially difficult for us, the rolling mill workers, to fulfil it was necessary to have muscles, endurance, and where could we get them with the miserable food of that time? But one way or another, after many days of arguments at the party committee, after the most meticulous discussion, when each applicant proved that it was he who should go to the front, 42 people were selected and released. And it was approximately the same in all factory collectives in all Ural regions. On the upper transoms of our shop, sewn up with black iron sheet, there were huge letters visible from the whole plant, everything for the front, everything for victory. And in the room of the Komsomol Bureau, among others, hung a poster, my friend, let us dedicate our soul's beautiful impulses to the fatherland. A. Pushkin. What moved the volunteers? Rational calculation of their actions would be easy to analyse even after 30 years. But the impulse of the soul. What does it consist of? I don't know exactly. Leo Tolstoy, and he only called this force that, according to him, one decides the fate of battles and wars, the power of the military spirit. And it is not to my liking to analyse these feelings meticulously. We were not drafted, not persuaded, on the contrary, not let go. And we went. We went into the mud, into the blood, into deadly fights. 
We went into hardships and deprivations, which we had enough of in the rear. I spent several days preparing to write a request to be enrolled in the Ural Volunteers. I was thinking about how. And it turned out that I was riding in a streetcar to work and noticed an old woman, someone's mother, looking at me with sad, sad eyes for a long time. She may have had a son killed at the front, and I am standing in front of her in a dashingly bobbed hat young, healthy, red-bearded. I came to the shop, changed into overalls, took a piece of paper from a notebook in the Komsomol Bureau, and wrote in a volley I believe that I must defend my state, the right to work and study, not waiting for my comrades to do it for me. I am perfectly healthy, hardy, not afraid of any work. Now the red pathfinders of the Sverdlovsk region painstakingly study the history of the Sverdlovsk tank brigade. Honourable name Elvskaya, the title of guards, five orders on the banner, and the Ural volunteers fought only 22 months. True, they spared neither life nor blood. By the end of the war, there were 38 heroes of the Soviet Union in the Ural Volunteers. Our Komsomol battalion of tank landing turned out to be fully twice decorated, i.e., every machine gunner, all officers had at least two combat awards. But the main thing, in my opinion, the signs of military valour on the banner, because indeed in the brigade prevailed all familiar and for all natural collectivist spirit. Dot 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 Dosverdlov's Kank Brigade until the evening of January 11th, 1945, before the new offensive, stood in Poland, behind the Vistula, west of Sandomir, in the area of Grzykamnia, in a low-lying forest. And for several months after the fall fighting on the Sandomir bridgehead, from which Hitler himself ordered us to be thrown out, the Uralians settled down and settled down well, if such an expression is appropriate to use for the front situation. Having replenished with equipment and people, preparing for new battles, they did a lot to make life more comfortable and cosy. The people were craftsmen indefatigable for inventions. And we competed incessantly in designing smokestacks, in improving the pipes to the stoves in the dugouts, in camouflage, in the device of drainage under the beds. Our father often grumbled. You always have Komsomol members doing something. We should use all our free time after combat training for political work. We're not at home in Europe. It's getting dark. Where are your agitators? The truth is concrete, comrade major. At the moment they're helping Uncle Vasya to make targets for tomorrow's shooting. At the front, unfortunately, there were almost no study aides. And that's why Uncle Vasya Vesely Ivanovich Sosnovsky, the artilleryman of the battalion, had to make it up in our battalion. We had to prepare targets, but there were no boards, nails or paint. And Uncle Vasya, who was universally respected and even worshipped because he was able to fix any malfunction of the machine gun in no time, and with three rounds to adjust the sight to the highest class of accuracy, quickly found a way out of the situation, always having helpers in any number. We took a thicker aspen, split it into strips, and carved the waist silhouette with an axe. The nails were cut from German barbed wire, there was plenty of it in Europe. For blackness the target was burned on a fire. Classes on combat training were conducted very intensively, every day, not less than ten hours, and constantly at night. From September to January on the Sandomir bridgehead in rain and slush, in wet snow and chilly fog, day and night the troops, being in tense defence, studied. The battalion was on the alert, and you did not know whether the enemy had again taken an offensive to throw us back behind the Vistula, or whether it was another training of interaction between tank crews and assault riflemen, a rush of five kilometres pedestrian tank, i.e., silently, without machines. German language courses worked. We practised to act at night in small groups of three or four fighters. We mastered a new automatic rifle PPS, which replaced the PPSA, Moita, more perfect. Again, jumping from the tank at full speed, and be able to catch up with it, climb up on the armour, at any manoeuvre. And the tankers have their own, but according to the same law, all the best acquired in battles must become the property of all. This is the interchangeability of the crew. This is the experience of ammunition stowage over and above the prescribed. The experience of driving at night in total darkness. The experience of long, long distance raids without stopping. And bits of experience the actions of tankers with machine gunners in the conditions of city streets. Further in the West, brothers, 
It is cramped, there will be no Russian and Ukrainian expanses. There you can't deploy tanks along the front. We will act in columns, maneuver among stone buildings. These words of the commander of our brigade, Guards Colonel Nikolai Grigorevich Chukov, are still remembered our commanders were able to look far ahead. At the classes of the organized political school, where everyone got acquainted with Germany in detail, at the Komsomol meeting, at the bureau, at the daily operative meetings, in any conversation the main thing were thoughts about how we would act. The experienced staff of the Corps was preparing for new battles thoughtfully and seriously. Of course, not without excitement. You bet. The enemy has been expelled from the borders of our homeland. The last decisive battles for victory over Hitler's Germany are coming. The liberating mission of the Red Army cleansing Europe from fascism has begun. These are my words from the newspapers of the time. And from the Front and Army and our Corp newspaper volunteer. These are the thoughts we lived with then. The Komsomol members our Swifts lived with them. They continued to be called so. Although everyone's hair had long since grown back, amateur company and platoon hairdressers tried to make the most fashionable hairstyles. Our battalion continued to publish a daily handwritten newspaper after Magic. Guards Private Slava Yakubovich, who produced it in 10 and then 20 copies, adapted so well that this work took him an hour, no more than an hour. He fulfilled this Komsomol assignment very zealously. Automatic, a standard typewritten piece of paper, on both sides unfolded text in block letters, as in a real printing newspaper. After the defeat of some German headquarters in previous battles, Slava had a pile of excellent copy paper and excellent thin but thick paper. He fixed ten copies at once on a specially adapted board and drew the whole page with a thin, hard pencil. According to the layout which we had drawn up beforehand, having calculated all the headings, columns and sizes of notes, a tank, a guard's badge, a machine gun and other elements of design Slava was able to depict with a few strokes. The unique newspaper his own, native battalion newspaper, there was no shortage of those who wanted to speak in it, was not only popular with everyone, but also a special love it was never smoked. It is still kept by many fellow soldiers. In school museums of the battle glory of the Urals, there are copies in the Central Museum of the Soviet Army. Only Arbatya was somewhat sceptical about it. No, he of course was pleased that in the battalion entrusted to him, there was a multi-circulation combat leaflet known among political workers on the entire Ukrainian front. But he did not let us the Komsomol Bureau rest on the laurels of best practices. Well, 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 he used to mutter, after reading the next issue from line to line. On paper you are doing great, you are ready to storm Berlin and hang Hitler. But what about here? And he tapped his finger expressively on his huge bald forehead. What he was pleased with was the widespread enthusiasm of our Komsomol activists for geography. The guys could draw a map of Europe, the borders, the front lines from memory. They could list all the cities and towns from Sandomir to Berlin. They knew the latest news not only from all our fronts, but also from the whole country, about the rear, and about the affairs of the Allies about their difficult defensive battles in the Ardennes. And the Swifts became bolder, more confident in themselves the combat experience appeared for a year of uninterrupted actions, and their own land was liberated. And the fresh brain, constantly excited by the exhilarating mood, absorbed so much information, as they say now, that Batya only grunted. Well, well, he gave us a scepticism that cooled us down, and slowly, deliberately tedious began to list the blunders, and in the second company yesterday shot at the credit, not all excellent and in the first the sentry at the post fell asleep. Not at home, you need triple vigilance, and you probably don't know who disgraced himself. Yes, we do, we discussed it. Pure accident, comrade major. Do tankers exempt mechanic drivers from duty? A mechanic will be in a special position in battles now. The one who was supposed to go got a letter from the Urals. He was also exempted from duty to write a reply and this one was persuaded to stand in return, he agreed, though he himself hadn't slept for two nights. They noticed it at once and replaced him. Nonsense. Everything is nonsense to you young people. You're ready to fight for ten more years. Absolutely not, comrade guards major. 
Sasha Permanov objected in an emphatically formal manner. There's a lot of work to do at home. This year we must definitely fight back. My father fell silent. Perhaps he thought the Swifts have grown up. Sasha Permanov had already been elected party leader in the company by the young communists, or perhaps Batya remembered how once he had decided to check the soldiers' duffel bags and almost every Swifts. Had all sorts of portable tools. Some had screwdrivers, some had vise grips, pliers, nails, drills, trophies from German camping workshops after the defeat of their tank units. And it wasn't lazy to carry them with you. But Uncle Vasya, the artilleryman, in his flying shop was supplied with trophy tools very well. When the rumble of artillery preparation announced the offensive of the first Ukrainian front, each of us felt not only the shoulder of our battalion comrades, but also the left and right flanks as far away as our imagination could reach. Somehow even mundanely, with the usual light excitement, as if at a regular training session, the brigade had left its camp the day before and moved to the initial position, to the front line. It was only when hundreds of guns began to speak at once. Perhaps the Allies are doing very badly in the Ardennes we will have to start early, someone suggested. And he was right. It is known that on the morning of January 12th, 1945, the Soviet army began the largest offensive. Five fronts along the entire Soviet-German front prepared for it. Mutually linked several operations the glorious pages of the Great Patriotic War. East Prussian by the forces of the Third and Second Belarusian fronts and Vistula Oda by the troops of the First Belarusian, First and Fourth Ukrainian fronts. There was a task that every soldier knew to defeat the strategic groups of the enemy and open the way to Berlin. The Ural Volunteer Tank went forward as part of the Fourth Tank Army of the First Ukrainian Front. Numerous memoirs about the war, including the commander of the Fourth Tank Army, Dmitry Danilovich Lelyushenko, who paid tribute to our Tenth Guards Corps, described this operation in detail. After two hours of artillery fire, the Hitlerites' defence was broken. Ploughed over, there was no living place left. The gun rampart was moved to the depth of the enemy's location, and the glorious infantry of the 13th Army went on the attack. And by evening, the tank armies of the front were put into battle, illuminated by rocket's night. Avalanche of tanks, painted white, flowing rapidly across the snow-covered fields, in several rows. As now I see some tall, huge barn, and the river of tanks, bifurcated so as not to hit it, wraps around the right and left of someone's peaceful building. But I turn around when we have passed it, the barn has collapsed. No one had hit it, it just crumbled the ground, shook under the stomping of the mass of heavy machines. There's a thousand motor murmur, an all-destroying clang. To feel oneself a part of such power is a great happiness in life. The Ural Corp was moving at the head of the 4th Tank Army. The Sverdlovska Brigade entered the breakthrough following the Chelyabinsk Brigade in order to overtake it when it was delayed in meeting the enemy and to rush on. When the Sverdlovska Brigade encounters heavy fighting, it will be overtaken by the same manoeuvre by the Perm Tank Brigade. And Chelyabinsk, meanwhile, will do its own and catch up with Perm. That was the plan fist by fist, replacing each other. The main thing to the west. To the west. After 40 to 50 kilometres tank armies separated, each on its own route, the territory occupied by the enemy cut to shreds and the advancing front successfully moved forward. Under the pressure of tanks, covered by groups of disparate units, the enemy did not have time to roll back to the west, scattered on the sides. Almost 24 hours our 30 checkers were rushing without special fights, knocking down on the move in short skirmishes Hitlerite garrisons, which did not have time to prepare for the meeting with us. Most of all there was work for machine gunners of the paratroopers. Boxes with spare ammunition, strapped directly on the armour, were quickly depleted. Good the supply didn't fail. The guise of our battalion, who never knew any interruptions in ammunition and grenades, still, when they remember, say thank you to the Chief of Ammunition Supply, Sverdlovsk volunteer Mikhail Alexeyevich Zikov. He was always on time, not waiting for the battle to end. Now, after so many years, it is very difficult for me to convey the feelings of a tanker who broke through into the enemy rear, the feelings of a machine gunner on the armour. Dot 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 Chelyabinsk Brigade, bypassing resistance nodes, moved forward quickly, 
and at two o'clock in the morning of January 13th, met a strong rebuff of the enemy at the boundary Gumenis Melshova. A brutal battle ensued. The commander of the Sverdlovsk Brigade, Colonel Zhukov, according to his task, left the 1st Tank Battalion for cover and led the brigade on its route. Again came the dawn. How does a tank brigade usually moves at high speeds in a column, in the rear of the dazed enemy, in front three tanks, a platoon of reconnaissance? At some distance the lead battalion or company, farther on the main force. For example, three tanks broke out on the highway, just crushed, overtaken on the move, a group of the enemy. Crushed trucks, Hitlerites. Automaticians from the armour with their fire, bursts and grenades, destroyed all fleeing. In front, still no one. To the right and left, by all signs, is a frozen swamp. It is necessary to pass through quickly the place for the battle, which is possible every minute, is not the best the highway is narrow. It's deserted, and the lead vehicle suddenly stops. Tank commander shouts mechanic driver on the TPU. What else is there? A horse, comrade lieutenant, the driver answers. What horse? I ask what stopped. The horse. Alive. The commander throws back the turret hatch, stands up waist deep outside, but he can't see what's there in front of the tank. The machine gunners jump down to the road, the driver gets out of the car. A horse, comrade lieutenant. Wounded, be you. The commander is nervous. On the radio from the rear tanks requesting swearing. What happened? You found a place to stop. Did you have a craving or what? He also gets down, goes to the forehead of the car. There, in front of the tracks, a horse with broken legs is lying across the highway. The mechanic and the machine gunners are trying to move it away, but the bloody croup is frozen. It won't budge. Give me the rope. Commands the lieutenant. It. In a minute, the tanks rushed on and the horse from the roadside looks at them with big intelligent eyes. By sunrise the reconnaissance flew into Petkovis. They radioed the battalion. They went out for a smoke. And the driver of the lead car says to his commander, I'm sorry, Lieutenant, but I couldn't push the horse. A dozen minutes later, an enemy reconnaissance team approached Petkovica from the west. Two armoured personnel carriers. We let them get closer. A shot of our tank, and in another ten minutes, when the whole brigade arrived, the assistant chief of staff, Major Ryzensev, interrogated the prisoners. According to the enemy, the Soviet tanks could meet him only 50 kilometres to the east, and on Petkovica moving towards the Russian column of 60 tanks of the 17th German Panzer Division. Combrig Colonel Zhukov short, curly-haired, black-haired, overcoat in a cape over overalls. He is cognibalizing the third day without sleep, the tanks almost never stop, but his head is fresh, he chuckles slyly and decides. We dodge the battle, we fulfil our task. Let's go around. Our goal is Le Suf, the crossroads must be ours first. Let their column advance at their leisure the further they are behind us. The worse for them, our artillerymen have 100mm anti-tank guns there. To the cars. Bypass march. All day and all night. Hitlerites are fleeing from villages along the way, and some garrisons are asleep, they don't wake up, we have no time. And there is a sentry in a horned helmet, illuminated by the rays of our hand flashlights, opens the barrier to the column, taking the tanks for their own. In the morning, the advanced detachment stormed into Leso. The commander was Senior Lieutenant Volodya Markov, a brilliant, lucky officer, a favourite of the whole Sverdlovsk Brigade, a tanker, as they say, from head to toe, a guy as if born for military service, for battle. Later he commanded our best 2nd Tank Battalion and became a hero of the Soviet Union. The enemy garrison tried to fight back, but 30 checkers crushed and crushed everything that fell on the streets of the town. Automaticheski paratroopers cleared block after block, detached Gina Bolkov, a quick white-haired swift. With his men captured the headquarters and captured the commander of the 248th Artillery Regiment, of the 168th Infantry Division, who did not have time to dress properly. You sleep a lot. The guys remarked to him. But the Nazis did not sleep through everything. 
In half an hour their 168th Division threw a battalion of infantry with 20 tanks into a counterattack on Lizo, brought six barrel mortars. The first onslaught hours repulsed. The enemy then pulled up additional forces. The brigade commander with two battalions of tanks and two companies of machine gunners rushed to Volodya Markov's aid. But there were already 60 enemy tanks. Another 50 armoured personnel carriers tried to break through to the centre of the town during the second and third counterattack. Then came another 15 German assault guns and a division of artillery. Six barrel mortars began firing at the volunteer guardsmen. Houses went up in flames. Twelve counterattacks had to repel tankers and machine gunners of the Sverdlovsk Brigade for that day. Eight hours of continuous battle. La Suve was burning, explosions of shells and mines blew up brick, plaster, floorboards with clouds of smoke. Thirty Chetverki then manoeuvred, shooting back, then burst forward. Traces of armour piercing shells bollocks, red hot, lined the air. Here are the lines from the preserved letter of Nikolai Verkovitz, a volunteer rolling machine operator, to his factory. Dot, 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 the new 85 mm guns on the 30 checkers, I'll tell you, are suitable. The tank commander Mikhail Pobodinsky, in a duel with the last model of the German Royal Tiger, splendidly pierced his 300mm forehead and pierced through. I saw it myself. Several dozen tanks and armoured personnel carriers destroyed ours. Some of ours were also hit, lost the ability to move, but continued to fire, fought. Five royal and eight ordinary tigers stood dead ahead of us and prevented the enemy himself. Then he went around. The tigers began to ram the outermost houses where our machine gunners were lodged. We barely beat them off. But then, dear comrades, our brigade received bitter news. Commander Zhukov is dead. Colonel Zhukov is dead. Can you imagine? And ours became furious. We launched an attack. Automatic riflemen pulled shells out of the hit and burning tanks carried them to the active ones. It's not easy for our swifts in the clash of iron with iron. But they are good. Tanks with black crosses on the armour stopped, then crept, then crept, then crawled away. In pursuit of them, ours rushed at their artillery and mortars. We paid them back in full. After the battle it became clear to everyone that Colonel Zhukov had really died, although many did not believe it. His body was thrown far away from the tank, which exploded from the enemy shell. Such is the fate of tankers in battle. All are in the same conditions and the colonel and lieutenant and private. Our Zhukov was always in all battles where the most tense situation was formed. Nikolai Grigorievich, we will never forget, his photo is in every former volunteer of the Sverdlovsk tank. We buried him in Lviv, we are the Sverdlovsk Lviv tank brigade. Many things are not told here, in these notes, my dear friends, my fellow soldiers, grey-haired, bald, aged veterans, former Swifts. I'm not writing the history of my native 61st Guards, Sverdlovsk, and not the history of our battalion of machine gunners. And though the flying years push those memorable events farther and farther away from us, there will be new books. The Veterans Council keeps everything that is necessary for this. In the days of crazy driving on tanks, when our Sverdlovskaya was 80 and 120 kilometres ahead of the advancing front line, remember what kind of organisation was in the brigade. At speeds no car should not lag behind, the brigade is always in a single fist, ready to give battle to the enemy at any moment. Do you remember how many wounded were left in the line? A little bit lighter wounder guy doesn't want to go to the hospital. He is driven away, the airplane provides it seemed to be happy, have a rest. But the guy shirked, continued to act, trying, bandaged, only to keep out of sight of his superiors. And now, after many years, we can already admit that they were helped by the head of the sanitary service of the I Brigade, Major Irakli Machvili. His car with a red cross, was always in the battle order of tanks. He picked up only selflessly brave medics. You don't want to go to the hospital. Can you stay down? That's right. You have to move. It will heal faster. Life is movement. Heroic doctor. Do you remember that the engine of the T-34-85 to tank had 250 hours of operation? But mechanics drivers in complex manoeuvre operations squeezed out 320 and 350. 
Golden Hands of N. Yanenkov, I. Morin P. Morozov. And they were not shy in speeds while the tiger will turn. I will go around it on my thirty shaverka, it was said for the sake of a red word, but not without reason. On January 15th, a large column of troops began to sneak past the liberated with the battle promnik, where Volodya Markov was wounded, in the evening in semi-darkness, Swifts, Petya Chashin and Genya Troitsky, in the combat guard, argued hours or not hours the column was coming from the east, and in such an order, as if on the offensive. But since they knew that with the capture of the Promnik station our tank armies had completed the encirclement of the enemy's Kiels radomsk grouping and cut off its last escape route by railroad, the guys correctly decided that the column was slipping out of the ring. Reported to headquarters. Vladimir Grebnev's company of tanks rushed to the front of the column. As a result of the attack the enemy tank was hit, several armoured personnel carriers, 50 crushed vehicles, 150 abandoned by Hitlerites, 126 prisoners. But Vladimir Grebnev himself with Nestorov's 30 Cheverka disappeared. A good crew and a company commander. Swifts more than an hour looking for the disappeared. Covered all the groves, ravines, until finally the tank did not appear, returning from the chase for the remnants of the broken column. The new brigade commander, the former chief of staff Vasily Ivanovich Zaitsev called Grebnev and calmly, briefly reprimanded they were looking for a company man, and he was chasing unkilled Hitlerites on a tank, trifling. We, comrade lieutenant colonel, for cars, justified Grebnev, and got carried away. For cars. On a tank? Well, yes, the road is bad, it holds them back, but nothing for us. We overtook fifteen of them, but we had to hit two of them with shells the chauffeurs must have been highly qualified, and probably their superiors fought them off. Why? Our thirty cheetah is as good as a passenger car. Combrick softened and gave the order to present Nestorov's crew for awards both mechanic driver Volkov and firing Bailitov. And I'm warning you. For the last time such adventures, he added, we did not come here for motorcycle racing. However, our marches with short battles resembled motorcycle races. The encircled Kiels Radom group of German troops was being destroyed by the front's formations, and tank brigades were disorganizing the enemy's actions to the west. The Svadlovskaya was on the move every day. They slept on the move the mechanic driver was replaced for a while in the crew. Tank commanders and those who had learned to drive sat at the levers, the swifts. Were dozing on the warm blinds behind the turret, one by one, not letting go of their automatic rifles. Dot, 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 dot a raid on Radosius, and a circular defence we were ahead of some part of the enemy, headed there. The march on Konsky the town, where the headquarters of the 4th Tank Army of Hitlerites was defeated, and they, not knowing the state of affairs, continued to move there their columns arriving from reserves and from the Western Front. Then the order was to wave and break into Petrokov, where only the assault riflemen had to work they were catching soldiers and officers of the Wehrmacht who had not had time to escape. The local population, who came out onto the streets, helped the Swifts. Crowds of enthusiastic people encircled our vehicles, carried treats, admired, hugged the guys, called them to their homes. What a technique. We've been waiting for you. But we didn't think you'd come so fast and so strong. Let's go to dinner. And we told with pleasure that our neighbours on the right, the troops of the 1st Belarusian Front and the army of the Polish army, had liberated Warsaw the day before and congratulated them. It was amazing how our machine gunners quickly mastered the Polish language. Then it was the same with German and Czech. They say that the Ural people have natural abilities born polyglots, perhaps because our region has been multinational for centuries. There were 20 to 30 nationalities in the Sverdlovsk Kank Brigade. I don't know exactly I didn't pay attention to it then. I remember that in one hand-to-hand -hand fight a grenade was thrown at Rivaz Magomedov the shrapnel hit his ears and forehead and smashed his automatic rifle clean through. He grabbed the Hitlerite's chest in fury. Why did you break the machine gun? and with his fist broke the bones in his face, knocked him to death. And when they filled in the award list for Bogotistvio, they asked what nationality he was. Magomedov answered without hesitation. You're alien, of course. 
In those days when we were fighting our way from the Vistula to the Oder, Goebbels announced all over Germany that a new top-secret weapon had been invented that would stop the avalanches of Russian tanks and make a decisive turn in the war. There is something wrong here, Arbatia doubted. You don't tell about a real secret on the radio. Or are they doing very badly, soothing themselves with fiction? In general, look for it guys, be more vigilant. And something did appear. Among the tankers there was talk about some faux sneaky. Several vehicles were knocked out of action, unexpectedly, out of nowhere, by shells coming from nowhere, breaking through the armour. Automatons Petya Chashin and Sasha Pachenkin managed to capture a Faustnik. Faust patron, which the Nazis began to arm the most desperate, really theoretically could stop any tank. It is a light tube with a powerful shaped grenade. It with a tail and stabiliser is pushed out of the tube's strong fuse, flies fairly accurately into the target and explodes, barely touches any surface. At first our core porps tried to weld on the brackets on the sides of the tank's false boards made of thin iron sheets or metal mesh. The correct calculation was that a false grenade would explode against the barrier, but the tank itself would not be damaged. It seemed to be effective, but how to act the machine gunners on the armour when there were such barriers? The guys got discouraged. They gathered the Komsomol activity of the battalion. My father calmed them down. This Goebbels Faust patron is a straw for a drowning man. The invention was shambolic. It would have worked against the Nazi tanks themselves. They had been ambushing them all the war. So they invented it against those who see poorly. And on our 30 checkers, on the armour itself, three or four pairs of eyes in addition. Am I right? Or have the assault riflemen forgotten that their main duty is to guard the vehicles in battle? Master the enemy's newest secret weapon the Komsomol Bureau decided. And the tankers soon gave up their false boards. It was a shame. Nikolai Yanenkov, one of the best mechanic drivers of our brigade, master of tank driving, laughs remembering. They gave SS men the highest level of soot. They came to Europe to liberate from fascism, and the cars with these antifa screens no 30 checker. Figure, no beauty. Some iron shed is driving. They refused because in the rapid offensive nimble, omnipresent and everywhere successful Swift's automatic machine gunners not only needed a lot of Faust patrons, which the Nazis did not have time to use, but also instructions to them on tissue paper. Aye, and they studied them and began to shoot themselves. And in a matter of days, almost everyone mastered this new top secret weapon. It turned out, as the old saying goes, the devil is not as bad as he is made out to be. First of all, the person firing the Faust grenade was bound to discover himself he had to put the tube on his shoulder and stand so that there was no wall or obstacle behind him, otherwise his back would be burned by the bursting flame. So, if you look carefully, Faustnik can be destroyed in time, while he adjusts, takes aim, letting the tank to be no further than 150 metres away. Secondly, you can see the grenade in flight, which means that it can be shot in the air with a good machine gun burst, and the paratroopers have learned to do it as if they were hunting ducks. In front of me an old frontline photo, made later dyed photographer of the political department Alyosha Koshkovsky. On it in a cloud of smoke Slava Yakubovich, produces a shot from the most secret Nazi weapon Faust patron, as it is written on the back. And I remember an incident just before the Oda. Several tanks with machine gunners had to take a village somewhere on the flank. We were about a kilometre away and we could already see it. And returning from reconnaissance, our corp, small plane, dropped a pennant with a note be careful. Full of Fasniki. They came on armoured personnel carriers. Tankers deployed vehicles along the front, so that approaching to shoot down the defenders' shells machine gun fire. Here we can already see on the outskirts of the solid row of Fasniki, put their pipes with piers, grenades, on the ends. They prepared to meet us, as if they were waiting for us in advance. 400 metres remained, 300 to 250, and the tanks stopped. The pause lasted a second or two. The paratroopers jumped off the armour, habitually, easily and dexterously, all put on each shoulder on the trophy fosse turned in a chain and walked across the field to the village in full height 
automatic rifles on the chest. Boys, boys as the song goes. They were still swifts, mischievous and venturesome, dashing, reckless. But they were already Ural guardsmen, calm, strong, confident in their ability to beat the enemy and in the rightness of their cause. And most importantly, with an excellent knowledge of their enemy, with a subtle psychological, even, I would say, political calculation of their friendly actions. They gave a volley from Fausts, followed by another. With cries of Faust. Faust, the Nazis dropped theirs and ran. Or a, a, a. Our tanks moved into the village, but almost nothing had time demoralized Faustians jumped into their armoured personnel carriers and gave full throttle. Those who could not scattered in foot order, falling under the fire of machine gunners. Only one elderly officer, tall, with glasses, with many awards on his chest, shot back until he was destroyed, and he managed to mortally wound Kostya Verkovik, the same Kostya who was attacked by a dog in the first days of service in our battalion. On January 21st, the troops of the 1st Ukrainian Front began to reach the Oda. The troops of the 4th Tank Army broke through to the Oda before the others, so it is written in the history of the Great Patriotic War. And then in the next order of the Supreme Commander-in-Chief, it was said the Red Army struck the enemy an unprecedented blow on the whole front from the Baltic to the Carpathians. Soviet troops with persistent fighting advanced from the borders of East Prussia to the lower reaches of the Vistula River by 270 kilometres, from the bridgehead on the Vistula south of Warsaw to the lower reaches of the Oder River by 570 kilometres from the Sandomir bridgehead. 480 kilometres the last figure is ours. The case was with our participation. I again quote history tank troops were advancing ahead of the general armoured armies, paving the way for them to the west and among the tank troops of the first Ukrainian was our Ural volunteer, our Sverdlovsk brigade, in it our battalion. In it our native Swifts. They reached Berlin, then liberated Prague. And by the end of the war our brigade was called as follows the 61st Guards Sverdlovsk Helvievskank Brigade of the Order of Lenin, Red Banner Order of Sivorov, Kutuzov and Bogdan Kmelnitsky. I am proud to have served in it.